Welcome to Winning Conversations. Uh, Andy and I are sitting down with a friendly face to the Heritage family, and that is with Natasha and David Powell. They are gracing us with their presence down from Michigan. We are so excited, so happy that you're here. Um, we want to catch up with you guys. We want to do a lot of things. So everyone, I just get ready. It's going to be an amazing winning conversation. First of all, how are you guys doing? Great. Great. It's great to be here. And let me say, I love what you guys are doing with this. It's great to sit down and just have conversations like about ministry, about life and find out what people are doing. And I, lo I love being here and I love all of you. Even Aww. you, Andy. Aww. <laughs> love you too. Thanks yeah. for having us. <laughs> no, thank you for being here. We are super excited. I've, I'm. This is one of the conversations that are why I I don't want to say agree to do this because that sounds very corporate to say, I agree to do these podcasts or these <laughs> conditions. But like originally they asked, like, why would you want to do this? And I'm like, because I want to have conversations with people that I don't know that are really titans of the ministry, of the faith, of the church who have had a massive impact and I don't know them. And you guys are part of that group of that I don't know very well. And so for, I'm like super excited to ask all these things. That's that. Yeah. This, this is going to be. I'm going to be a very like happy fly on the wall. And you have a great story, a very inspiring oh, story. Yes. Like yes, like so many things. Uh, there are mm -hmm. so many questions. So I'm going to let you start because I feel like I'm going to be I'm okay. Well, up on the caffeine. I feel like what is yeah. happening in your world in Michigan? What are y'all doing now since you've moved back? So we're doing good. Uh, even moving back to Michigan, we weren't sure. We love it in Texas. We loved it. We were here for two years. She came in at, a, at, at really a crucial time to help um, get the children's ministry going. What and year was it that y'all moved? That was when we moved here. Mm -hmm. We moved down here in 2020, right um, Right during COVID. And so we were down here for two years and uh, just, it's been, a, it was an amazing two years. If we could have stayed, we we would have. We we love, it. even coming down here now, we, I mean, there, we, we made such good friendships and the church here is Love it. Such a good church. And we loved coming down. But with with what we had going on and uh, with the opportunities I have in my job, um, we felt like God was telling us to it was time to go back to Michigan. And we weren't sure if this was always our forever place. But, but we were obeying God. We just were trusting him. The season we were down here was a great season. It was. It we, really we was. We only have good memories. Like even when we drive past where our house was that we lived down here, it was just – with nothing but good memories. Mm -hmm. So that's great, you know, to be able to say about experience. What do you miss the most about Texas? The people. It's the people. It's not the weather. I don't mind. I don't mind. Not having a Chick-fil-A like five minutes down the road. Oh, <laughs> yeah. too, for me, but, not for her. But, but with the city and all its advantages, you also get the traffic. So, you know, in a, in a town, you don't have that kind of traffic. But even moving back to Michigan, you know, we, we poked around at, at houses. We weren't sure. And then all of a sudden... You know, it was kind of like our dream home on a on a on a private drive that we've always loved. Tasha would make me drive her down Highland Drive when we were first married, and she would just be enamored with the. With, it was just beautiful. There beautiful, was beautiful houses, homes. Beautiful homes. It was yards. on a golf course, and we we dream and say, "Gosh, I wish you know we'd love to live out here someday." And then when we were up there in the spring, we were just kind of looking around at houses, and this house wasn't even for sale. And yet Tasha got, had our, my cousin, who's a realtor, get in touch, you know, would you ever sell it? She ended up agreeing to sell, you know, it, long story short, we ended up with a house on her dream road. It was just the, how it all shook out was just God to even bring us back up there in the first place. It's a great but house. There were lots of houses we wanted to look at and Dave wanted to see. So we went to go see those and we didn't like any of the ones we thought we would like. Then God brought it back to my remembrance that this house used to be on the market, but Dave hadn't wanted to see it, even though it was on my dream drive. <laughs> but you didn't, you had to go way back and you couldn't really see it. So God brought it back to my remembrance. He's like, if none of the ones you thought you would like, you like, then why don't you go look at the one you didn't think you would like? And then we did. And then it ended up being ours. And it's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's required some work and Dave has worked really hard to make it great, but you know, and we're still, there's always things to do. It's, you know, they had some things to fix up, but it's, I mean, only God, only God can know exactly what you like. Yeah. And even, you know, sometimes you don't know what you like, but God always knows what you'll like. It's amazing. I love the house. It's beautiful. Yep. I wasn't invited. <laughs> I just saw pictures. Don't worry. I just saw no, pictures. No, no, it's cool. No, no, no. Will... You're, you're invited anytime, Doesn't Dan. You and Trishon. Doesn't sting at all. Doesn't sting at all. <laughs> Well, um, well, I had a second diagnosis of cancer before I moved back, so uh, 
we moved back and had my oncologist that I loved, Dr. McGrath up there, and she was great and um, started treatment there. And uh, they wanted to do surgery or something, and so I prayed about it and decided not to go with their recommendation. Not saying that other people should do that. You just got to seek God on your own. But then... Uh, then I went to the doctor, surgeon, and I asked him for what I wanted because God said, you can ask for what you want. I was like, I can? So I asked him for what I wanted, and he agreed to do what I wanted. And so um, he did the surgery that I wanted, and then we got scans done, and I'm cancer-free again. That mm. is amazing. Yes. Congratulations. That's yes. awesome. Thank you. How long has that been since the diagnosis? God is good. I, my first diagnosis was in 2019. And then by 2000, May of 2000, that was November of 2019 and May of 2020, I was cancer free. And then in November of 2021, I got diagnosed with a tumor in my brain and another lump in my breast. And, but by what is the September of 2022, or I guess, yeah, that's when I had the scans, October, October, I had the scans and I was completely cancer free. Wow. Yep. Praise the Lord. It's yeah, amazing. it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Yep. And the surgeon here that did the brain surgery was amazing. Dr. Cho in Fort Worth, Medical City, Fort Worth, was amazing. Loved him. And I He's never a sponsor. had. sponsor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was just super great. I mean, positive person that, like, the best person you could ask for to, I guess, have brain surgery. So, if you're going to do it. Yeah, if you're going to have brain surgery, he was the best. So, anyways, it was great. I never had any pain. God is so good. That's how it's supposed to be for his kids. It's supposed to be different. It's supposed to be different for his kids than it is for the world. So I'm going to circle back to something that you kind of glossed over. And okay. so so cancer ran through my family pretty aggressively. So I have a lot of experience with that. And, um, you know, my wife as well. We like, Cancer has been a real thing in our, our family on both sides. And I know the faith it took for the people that I know that walked through it and the, some that didn't. You know what I mean? That, like, you know, a lot of our family members didn't come out on the other side the way you have, which is such an amazing blessing. But – through that process, like, what was that like in terms of, like, your walk, your relationships with the father, obviously, but then, you know, your husband, like, like what is that like to walk through that phase? Um, God is just faithful. It, you know, I'm going to start back when I was a child. I mean, my parents brought us up in church. You know, a lot of people today say you can't make your kids go to church. But it's not about making them go to church. It's about training them up in the way they should go. And because my parents, quote unquote, made us go to church, you know, we grew up strong in the word. I mean, they, they were serious about what churches we went to, what kind of word we got, what the children's ministry was like. So we grew up, we grew up going to church Sundays, Wednesdays, special services. Even if we had school the next day, they would just believe for us to get extra rest for every hour of sleep. That's what they would pray at night. Um, so I think, so when I went in, they didn't know what was wrong. I finally went in and the, and the, oncologist looked at me and said, I wasn't really understanding stage four or anything about cancer. I've never researched. I don't know anything about, I didn't know anything about it. So she was talking about stage four. I didn't know anything. And I'm like, okay, well, when is, you know, when is the treatment over or whatever? And she's like, um, she just looked at me and she goes, you're going to die of breast cancer. And I just looked at her and I said, no, I'm not. My God's a God of miracles. And I, because that word that had been sown in me all of my life, all of my life, 40 years or whatever of my life at that point, it came, it was in me. So it came out of me in that moment because I knew what she said wasn't the truth because God's word is the truth and nowhere in God's word does it say that I'm going to die early. It says that I will be satisfied with long life. And so from that point on, from me saying that, and right, you know, before I even went in, God had already told me, refuse fear. Two simple words, but that, that was amazing because that got me through everything. Um, refuse fear, just refuse it because we have a choice. It doesn't feel like we have a choice sometimes, but we do. We have a choice. And fear comes in many different ways, but and, and in many situations. I mean, we don't know what heaven's like because in this earth, I don't think any of us have ever really even gone through maybe an hour or a day without fear. But in heaven, there's no fear. Like everything makes sense and everything's just filled with joy and peace. And we don't even we don't even have any idea what that's like. So we have to refuse fear. And so from that moment, I just refused fear. I didn't even believe it was cancer until they like did the biopsies and they did everything and they came back and said, this is what it is, even though other people were like concerned. 
you know, some people were like, do you understand how serious this is? And I was like, I guess not. Because it's, <laughs> I guess not because it's not what God's word says. So it wasn't serious to me. And I just, and I only, I don't, I give my parents credit for taking me to church, but I also just want to give God credit because he, he graces us. Like that word that was in me and that rose up and got me through all of the treatment and all of, all of the situation that, that, that wasn't me. I didn't do anything. I didn't have to, I didn't go and like get my Bible out and research everything. And every moment of, of all the treatment, everything, he would bring a verse to my mind. He would bring a song that I'd sang in Sunday school or at church to, to my heart. Um, and I didn't, I didn't have to do anything. And I, you know, even, even recently, you know, you think you have to, like, I would think I'd have to do, like, Lord, what do I have to do to, like, put this to rest to, like, cut the giant's head off? You know, I just want it over, you know? And he, he just lovingly would tell me, you don't have to do anything. Jesus, I had a dream one time, and he just, it was a dream, and God just said to me in the dream, you don't have to do anything. Jesus already did everything. So, so he's good. You just have to rest. You have to rest. You just have to rest in believing. And that's, and that's, you know, Keith Moore says that's where the fight is. Am I fighting or am I resting? Am I fighting or am I resting? But we're fighting to rest. Because I was thinking today when um, we were in the service, and I was thinking, <laughs> I think the Holy Spirit said to me, what does believing look like? And I had to think about it. But believing doesn't look any different than your normal life. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to. You know, you just, you 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 look the same. You look the same whether you're in a hard time or in a good time because you're believing in good times, you're believing in hard times. You look the same. You praise the same. You talk the same. You play the same. You know, you live. It's the same. Believing should look the same. So, so how did that affect, like, so obviously you were standing on those things. Mm-hmm. But you had to be right there next to her. Yeah, yeah. See. So how was that journey for you? Because <clears throat> I'm sure it wasn't rainbows and skittles the way it's being now. Rainbows and skittles, you know what I mean? But like yeah, that, that like yeah. it's not a big deal to me. It's not serious. It's like no, that's easy for you to say. But the but husband God, God next had engulfed me in this like grace bubble. No, that's a yeah. faith like, bubble. Like so, I so it'll be interesting to hear what you have to say. Like <clears throat> no, it, it's yeah. I would love to tell you I was this faith giant right <laughs> along with her, um, and and a lot of it I I I I was in and out. You know I can't. I mean there was a lot of emotions going through the whole process. So when it shook out, um, you know she glosses over a lot of it. But the the diagnosis in 2019 was not a good diagnosis. I mean they had said so it was stage four. It was stage four breast cancer. It was in. It was a lump in her breast. Also. Um, it had, it had eaten out a chunk of her sternum and it had spread to her liver, her lungs, her back, her breast and her sternum five places. I mean, so the, 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 the outlook in the natural with, in the community was not good. That's why she's talking, she's, you know, talking to her about treatment and Tasha, you know, um, is just the whole time has like, people would tell her, listen, you just have extreme faith you know, or, or whatever. And it's like, Hey, you know, if that's the best you can, you can call her, that's pretty good. But that's why the doctor finally looked at her. Cause she was just asking questions like, well, I'm just going to go out of my light. Then this isn't going to affect me. And finally the doctor stopped and was kind of frustrated and said, listen, you're, yeah. you're going to die. I like, like the doctor, I want you to realize you're going to die of breast cancer. We're just going to try to keep you alive as long as we can. And you know, when they say that, I mean, that'll rock your world, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as a husband with a, with a daughter and it's like, wow, I don't know. Like, and, and I mean, in the moment, I mean, I said, she said, no, no, you know, no, I'm not, you know, I'm, what'd you say? No, I'm not. I'm no, a, I'm not. And, my God's a God of miracles. And I said, we're a faith family, you know, we, and. And my other sister said, we believe in miracles. So, so all in, three in, of in us. In the moment, yeah. you know, I was fine. But I mean, you look back on it, dude, it rocks your world when they, when they start talking like that. And, uh. And we, and, and, and for a long time, you know, we had these, we had healing scriptures and I would go in and out of, of man, just wanting to confess them like all day, you know, like uh, what, what can I do? You know, I, we believe in, the, we believe in healing, you know, what can, and I mean, for a while we laid down and I mean, I believed we were going to wake up and that lump was going to be gone. You know, like I just, and when you believe and you just, and you keep believing and, 
and it goes by and it doesn't happen, you know, as a husband, I'm like, God, what, what, what else do I have to do? What else? We believe yeah. your word. What do I need to confess more? What am I doing? What do I, you know, what is it that I need to do to get this done? And, you know, and Tasha would even tell me like this. God's she, working. He's I mean, working. she's the one going through it and she's like, listen, God's working. Don't worry. You know? And she was just, and I, and I mean, I tell people, you know, when people ask about the story and whatever, um, I say, you know, my, I mean, my, my wife is a different, she's a different breed. I mean, she is a faith girl. I mean, through the whole thing, it just has not, you know, you, you start out, you start out there, you know, and then, and so then in my mind, it's, I mean, there's all kinds of thoughts going out like, okay, yeah. you know, I don't, I mean, I'm a faith, I mean, I, we're, we're a faith family, but thoughts want to come to your mind constantly. Okay. So how long are we going to have her? You know, what, what is going to happen? I mean, is this, is she not going to get completely healed? Do I need to prepare myself? You know, and it's, yeah. and then, and then you feel guilty. Because oh, you're my, thinking that way. Because I'm thinking like mm -hmm. that. Oh God, forgive me. Why am I even thinking about this? Mm -hmm. You know? And so it was, it was a, it's been a, it's been a wild ride, but after, so, you know, and she, and, and she wasn't even going to take treatment until God told her to like, that's how much faith she had. Like most people I need to get, when can I start chemo? Let's, can I please get my breast removed? Cause I wanted God to get all credit. I didn't even want medicine to get credit. I wanted, I wanted the miracle to be totally solely on God, but my family obviously wanted me to do chemo. And, uh, I, so reluctantly I did, I, I agreed, you know, and I did the chemo, but after I think I'd done the first treatment, um, then God had ministered to me. Like sometimes he brings things naturally and sometimes he brings them supernaturally. Like Elijah at the brook, he had the water to sustain him, but the ravens brought him food. Sometimes it comes through a natural means like the water and the river. And sometimes it's supernatural like the ravens. And so I disagreed. And then when he told me that, I just, I knew he, what he was talking about was go ahead and do the chemo because I'm going to, I'm going to be there. So it's okay to, it's okay to do. I want to know how you handled that with Brooklyn. I mean, she as was, a parent, that's like I've, one of the hardest things to have to explain. How did you explain it to her and how did she take it? Because that has to be, I mean, think, that's hard for you to wrap your head around. I can't imagine. She was seven at the time and we waited until for sure we knew what it was. And then um, I didn't even tell her right away what it was. I told her that, you know, I was having some issues in my chest and that I had to be on some strong medicine and I might lose my hair, which I ended up doing, which she cried when she saw. Um, when I started losing my hair, I went and shaved it off. And I looked tough, like I was going to the army. It was pretty cool. I felt, I felt tough. But anyways, she did not like it. So she, cri <laughs> she cried. And I said, it's going to be okay. It all grows back, you know. But um, so then um, we knew other people knew and other people were going to be talking about it. So I just told her that... Um, that the doctor had said we that I had cancer in my chest, and but it's okay because you know God or God is a God of miracles and He's going to heal me. Um, and the Bible says you know that I'll live a long life. And the hardest thing about it is cancer's everywhere. It's in movies. It's in mm -hmm. Hallmark movies. It's in TV shows. It's yeah. you. It's in commercials. I mean, it's everywhere. And so it'd be interesting to hear Brooklyn's story mm -hmm. about what um, how it was for her and. But um, she handled it like a trooper. She would, you know, on days I'd be tired. Um, she would want to. She would write up a little note with a bell. She'd bring a bell or or something that would make noise, and she'd say, "Mom, ring." And it would the note would say, "One time for food, two times for water, three times for a hug," you know. And so she sweet. was yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. She's just That's she's ridiculous. so yeah, loving. She's, she's so loving, and she just was great. I yeah. mean, she was great. And even this last time you know, with the diagnosis and she, she, so, so fast forward to 2021 when I got diagnosed again and I had a tumor in my brain and a lump in my breast. And I was reading one day and, and God said, read, read David and Goliath. So I read, so I went to it and I read David and Goliath for Samuel, I think 16 or 17. And, and as I was reading, God just told me exactly what I was supposed to tell Brooklyn that, did you notice, you know, tell, read her the story, to read her the story right out of the Bible, and then say, did you, re, did you see how everybody was afraid of the giant? And, but not David. David wasn't afraid. And I said that there's a lot of people out there afraid of cancer, but we aren't afraid. We aren't afraid because God's on our side. And, you know, 
And so he just used that story for me to tell her and brought me peace, brought her peace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this giant, just like the giant died, it's, you know, it's going to be killed in my life too. Do you like send the doctor that said you're going to die letters all the time now? No, just no. Like, just I like think monthly she... reminders that you're still around. <laughs> yeah. Like cancer free. The second you know, time, like... the second time we went in, she, she, she called, she said that I would be miracle number three. So, so I think she, she came around to, I think she us. thought we were in shock. I, I think she thought I was in shock and she wasn't getting through to me that this was serious. So the, the second time, and I said, yes, I'm going to be miracle number three. So I don't know if there was two other people who had been diagnosed who well, had clearly. lived. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I don't really know. I didn't ask, but I said, yes, I'm going to be miracle number three. Man. So she, yeah, and I still love her. She's Dr. McGrath. So she's. No, I'm not. I would, maybe, maybe she should try playing for our team. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty sweet team to be on. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and there's another. Golly. There's another couple testimonies even within the the cancer diagnosis and everything is uh, for people that don't understand like stage four but with stage four breast cancer their protocol is you don't have surgery you can't because when there was the lump we, we wanted to get it removed and they wouldn't let us because the stage four so they don't typically do st surgery on stage four cancer patients mm -hmm. so the fact that so we we went along we did the chemo um, mixed with a lot of uh, with a praying church with with just faith around us and um, and, and we came out the other side and, and they even sent us up to U of M to, to get checked out. And when we walk into U of M after we do the chemo, because we had got a clear scan and that they weren't, they weren't expecting the cancer to disappear. Oh. So we go up to U of M and, uh, and when, right when we walk in, I'll never forget this. We walk in the elevator and we go to check in and we're say, uh, hey, Natasha Powell is here to check in to see Dr. Hayes. And she, her, she lights up and looks at, she goes, you're Natasha Powell. They just, we just talked with the whole tumor board just had a whole uh, meeting about you and uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead and sit down. And so it was because, cause the meeting was okay. Well, just if she still wants to get a, a mastectomy or double mastectomy, we're going to go ahead and let her because the, the, from then on, this is what they tell us. You're, they, they ask us what we want to do. You're in a gray area. We're not usually, we're not used to this. So basically, you know, if you, if you want to have surgery, you can, if, if you don't, which before your stage four, it's, it's off the table. Insurance won't pay for it. They won't even do it. Mm -hmm. So we went from insurance off the table to you can do whatever you want <laughs> that they had brain surgery, which in in itself, even finding the tumor was on a whim. We, we, they don't even scan your, yeah, your head. I didn't have any dizziness. I wasn't having any headaches. They didn't even know. I didn't know there was a tumor in my brain. We just happened to mention that my shoulder was hurting. Can I go to the chiropractor? They're like, let's do a scan of your neck. Well, when they did the scan of my neck, they thought they saw something in my brain. So then they did a brain MRI. And I mean, God is, he's, I, you know, we can't explain like, well, if God knew it was there, then why couldn't he just get rid of it? Or why, you know, why, why this and why that? But, you know, I had to come to the groups that, you know, you can ask why all day long, yeah. but in the end, that's not trusting God because he has a reason, even if we don't know it, mm -hmm. if we don't know it, we just trust him that there is a reason and it's all going to come together in the end and we're going to have victory and we're going to have a testimony and it's going to be exactly how God has it played out. So yeah. no matter how long it takes. Exactly. Exactly. You have a lot of faith and there's, you make it seem so easy. I know it's not easy, but you do have a lot of faith, but what would you tell somebody who's in a similar situation or believing for good health or, you know, all that stuff that maybe doesn't have that, isn't um, on that level of faith as you are. What, what could you tell them or what could you encourage them? Don't to give just, up. Yeah. You, you can't give up. You just got to trust God. You have to believe his word. You have to believe his word. And the, what I would say is there's going to be mental battles and it's nonstop. The, like I didn't talk a lot when I was going through it because there was nonstop mental battles. And sometimes you just can't open your mouth and give, give it power. Yeah. So, you know, the devil, he has a way of every, I mean, yeah, I, I just didn't talk about it. Like thoughts would come, like thoughts come from the devil all the time. Like, you know, is Brooklyn going to be without a mom? Um, you know, you know, I think this comes from the movies, but even things like maybe you should put together a will or maybe you should write Brooklyn a letter for, you know, if anything were to happen to you. But I refused it. I refused 
refused to even write a letter because I wasn't even going to give an inch or even a like millimeter to that thought because no, no, I will be here. There's no reason to write a letter. There's no reason to do a video, you know, but all in the movies, you know, that always looks yeah. good and that always, but I was like, no, I, I refuse. I refuse feeding thoughts the like doubt. that. Yes, it's feeding the doubt and it, it's making room for doubt. It's making room. And so I didn't make room for fear and doubt. I refused it. And, and it's, it's some day, some days it was, you know, definitely every hour, if not every minute, a thought. And, but you, if you make room for God, if you make room for the Holy Spirit, with the thought, the, the Bible says that temptations will come, but with the temptation, which come from the devil, with the temptation, God will make a way out. And that's how it was for me. It, yes, I would hear those thoughts, but I would not meditate on it and I would refuse it. And sometimes I would recognize it as a lie and say, well, that's a lie. So the opposite is true. So I will be here a long time. And I, you know, Brooklyn will have a mom. And I would say it out of my mouth sometimes. And, and, but God was so faithful. He would make a way out with every thought that came, like the thought that the cancer is going to be spreading, the cancer spreading. But God gave me a verse like, no, it's not because no weapon formed against you will prosper. And prosper means to increase. So no weapon formed against me would increase. It would not grow. It, so he would give me these things. So if you refuse the thoughts of the devil, God will be there with another, with another voice. Even I would turn on um, Believer's Voice of Victory. And there would be somebody speaking and it would be just what I needed to hear at just that moment or, you know, or going to church. I mean, sitting in a service or being in the praise and worship, like just letting God minister to you, but not making, I would tell people, don't give room to the devil, but make room for God. Don't give room, fight those thoughts, fight those thoughts. Do not listen to them and don't make any room because it's easy to feed fear and feed doubt, but you just have to refuse it and then feed your faith by saying and saying what God says, saying what the Holy Spirit says, singing the songs that come to your mind um, that he gives you, just fight, fight. So, I mean, I don't even know how to express, like I truly am lost in how amazing that story is, you know, because so often you don't see that. Like you see the other side of it. You see the cancer win or anything else. And then knowing the full details of, of where that process was at is, even more so as a church family, we were all so excited and are continually so excited to to yeah. hear the amazing news coming from you. But the one thing I kind of heard that was, I think is so amazing was what you were given as a, as a child, like the, the foundation that you were given like that, which is so Im important to how you walked through this was the foundation you were given. And is that why you had such a passion to be in youth ministry, just to kind of like teach the, the next generation to give them the same skill sets you were given? Or where did that passion for youth ministry come from, I guess, is the better better way to say it. You know, even when I was younger, I mean, I remember being in a church in Ohio. We grew up in Ohio, and I would just be drawn to children. Um, there was this little girl named Esther Lynn, and she, she had kind of weepy eyes, and she was probably, I don't know, four years old. And for some reason, she would just come to me. Like, she wouldn't go to anyone but her. She was so shy, but she would come to me, and we would play. And I just loved her. I just loved her. I loved hugging on her. Um... And I just remember always being drawn to kids. And then I uh, went to college and I became an educator. So I was a teacher. I was a math teacher for 15 years and loved being in the, the best thing about teaching was the, the children, the, the students. It wasn't the pay? No, not the pay, <laughs> not the not Weird. the paperwork, not the... I'm told the bed of lies. <sighs> <sighs> so, uh, but, you know, being with the, the kids and just enjoying them and, and where they are in their lives and helping, I just... I've always loved to help, um, whether it's my parents, my parents are pastors, whether it's helping them, helping my sister, uh, my sister, my twin sister is a starter. She likes, she has all kinds of visions and dreams and, and she has ideas. She's an idea person. And she would, you know, and I would just, and I just get caught up with her ideas and help her finish because I'm a finisher. So I would always make sure it got finished or all of her projects get finished. And um, I just, I guess I'm always about just helping people, helping children. I just want them to grow up. I just want children to grow up just knowing, knowing who God is and knowing the truth. I, that's the other thing. I'm, I've always, I grew up just very black and white, like right or wrong, yes or no. I, that's probably like math. There's a right answer. There's a wrong answer. It's not subjective. It's very objective. And I just, I want kids to know the truth so that when they hear a lie, that they will know it's not true. Like, you're going to die of breast cancer. No, I'm not. 
Like if they hear a lie of whatever the devil tries to send their way, that they will know it's a lie and they will know what the truth is. And that's what I'm passionate about. So uh, I've always just been around kids. It's my favorite. It's way easier talking to children. And, and they're so <laughs> honest. I love their honesty. I feel like as adults, we like hide stuff all the time and, and just people hide behind masks. And children are just open and honest and it's refreshing. And I can be like that with them. You know, I've always been about just being honest with them. I think that's another reason why kids are drawn to certain adults is because adults are the ones that are honest. They can tell. They can tell when people aren't real. And I like real. Kids are way more faithful, too, than adults are. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, I know this is because of the teachers like you and, like, the teachers in Addie's class, but there's times where, like, her stomach will be hurting and she starts praying it for it before I even get to it. Like she's oh, on top of it, but that awesome. comes from the teachers and the people in her class that like actually care to invest the word and invest that like they're, yeah, they're on top of it. Yeah. They just believe it's yeah. childlike faith. Yeah. Let me jump in. So for her, for her, uh, calling, cause it's a calling, uh, in children's ministry, if until you see it, you don't really no, but it's, it's, God has called her to kids. I remember when we first started dating, she, uh, she was, she was always the children's minister at the church up there. Um, but she would go to some conferences and do the children's ministry during the conference. And so there was a conference, um, you know, in a, in another town. And so we were dating. And so I just, I went up there with her and she, that's the first time I saw her in class. It was before I really, cause I didn't go to church at her church or anything. Um, that's a whole nother story. I didn't really even go to church before I met her. Um, that's why I, you're here right now. I'd probably, glad, you made, <laughs> glad you made it. I'd probably be um, face down in a ditch if I didn't meet her. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she, I remember standing in the back of that classroom and it was in Jackson, Michigan, just enamored with the, how amazing it's, it's hard to explain, but to see her in a classroom with kids, it's, uh, she's just amazing with them. The kids, the way they respond, it's, it's, you know, it's something that you can't explain until you see it. It's a calling with kids. She has such a ability to minister to them. And I remember just seeing her do that. And I was just like, wow, this, this woman is amazing. And from then on, she's always just been about the kids always. I know we, I guess like a ship's passing in the night. Like you, you guys were moving back to Michigan right when my right. wife and I started getting involved in more of the youth ministry side of it. And as right. soon as I'm like, ah. Oh. I hear rumors about this person. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I can't believe all the hype. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> but no, like you left a, a lasting impression. Like it's still, there's still standards and there's still like, you know, like you were saying, like the excellence for kids and how that you go about that. And like, that's what's so crazy here at this church more than any, I mean, I wasn't at youth ministry at a lot of churches, so let's, let's go ahead and call it that what it was. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I can't speak for all of them, but the ones that I know about, like, like, the way that we just inject the Holy Spirit into our kids at this church, like in this ministry at Heritage of Faith, like I have never seen that. Like when I, when you talk about Addie, how she prayed, like, like I've seen her do it in class. You know, we've, we've seen these kids receive the Holy Spirit, like pray in the Holy Spirit, like, like right. don't question it. Like it is such an amazing thing to see how these kids operate and their gifts and like, and it's, and it comes from the community of, of believers that we've kind of created here. So Mm -hmm. And that a lot of it started with what you, the, the, the seeds you planted, you know, at that ministry level. So that's really awesome. I love that all the teachers, you know, care, care about the children. And they, they, you know, even when I was here, they would just, they would trust me. They would trust me with the children. They would trust my, you know, advice. I remember, you know, I, I remember clearly one time I just knew, I knew we were supposed to speak on the Holy Spirit. And it was a night that the preteens were going to be in with us for a little bit. And I went to the preteen teachers. I'm like, you guys, this, I, I really think this is what we're going to teach on. And I, I'd really like to keep everybody together. What do you think? And we all came together as a group and we kept them all together and we taught on the Holy Spirit. And each person gave their testimony of how they received the Holy Spirit, which of course, none of us knew each other's stories because we'd never talked about it before. And they were all different and the children got to hear. And it was, it was awesome because- First of all, God, God gives you ideas. Even God cares about the children. You know, like I think sometimes people don't realize how much he cares about the children. 
And so he will give, if you're listening, he will tell you exactly what to say and what to do with them and what they need to hear, what they need in their lives for this week. Because you, we all know going into public schools right now, they're going into a, like a, a war zone, yeah. really. And so we, we can't take any moment for granted that we have them. We have to give them what they need for their battles. And that in that moment, we all came together. People, the kids received the Holy Spirit. And, and I just know that God, just to go back to what you're saying about the Holy Spirit, is God wants his people filled with the Holy Spirit from young to old in these last days. And I don't know how many days we're going to be here, but in these last days, he needs us all filled with the Holy Spirit, especially children, because that's where the power is. And that's what we're going to need in these last days. And that's what's going to set us apart. In these last days, God... God's expecting for it to be different for us. Just like when when Pharaoh, I mean, this goes back to my can, the cancer story, everything. The kids in the public school, our families. In When Moses went to Pharaoh and the plagues all happened in the book of Exodus, well, by the fourth plague, no longer was it happening in the land of Goshen. In the land of Goshen where the Israelites lived, God's people, where they lived, it was different. And that gets attention. That gets attention. There, there weren't, and none of the plagues were happening in that little place in that piece of land. And so that's how I believe it's going to be in the last days. Is this going to be different for us, for God's people? And that's what's going to draw people because God needs people drawn into his kingdom. In these last days, he doesn't want anyone to perish. So that goes for kids, adults, everything. And so in the last days, it's going to be different. It's going to be different for us if we will believe, if we will believe. And that goes for the kids in the schools. That goes for the adults on the workplace. That, and that's not just in churches. That's in our everyday, ordinary lives. So that's where the ministry happens. This well, this question's specifically directed at David. Um, the suit game in the front row of our church has <laughs> dropped significantly <laughs> since you've gone away. So I need you to just. What are your thoughts on that? Ooh, that's <laughs> tough. I don't. I have. I have nothing. I don't. I didn't realize that my suit game carried that much weight. So. I didn't either. Um, <laughs> first of all. Game recognized game. Uh, <laughs> Amen, uh, brother. <laughs> uh, as, as a former suit wearer, I always, I, I, one of the first things I said when my wife and I joined this church, I'm like, oh, they take it serious here on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. We're not true. used to Southern church, you know, we're very, uh, uh, again, uh, flip flops and hoodies. Like, oh, that's your good hoodie? Whoa. <laughs> oh, is someone getting married today? What's going on? You know, um, but oh now, uh, you know, seeing your uh, suit game back in action, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> His yeah. suit game was strong. Yeah, I don't know. I was know. just thinking it's, about it. I don't know. I mean, I guess I took that anointing with me. I don't know. Yeah, I need you to start laying <laughs> hands on people. You know what I mean? I need you to start bringing it back. All right? I'll see what I Be can do. Be a river. Let it flow we'll through tonight. you. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll pray tonight. <laughs> so I know we're on a podcast, so nobody can see right now, but this is um, Nikki Deaton's twin. I heard a funny story when you first Wait, visited. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? No. Uh -huh. So yes. the people were like hugging you, thinking that you were her when you first visited, right? Yes, yes. What is it like being a twin, first of all? Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I don't ever care if somebody calls me Nikki. They always want to apologize. I'm like, it's no big deal. I'm like, <laughs> I love her, you know, whatever, whatever. She doesn't mind being called Tasha, I don't think. Um, it's great. It's always like, no matter where you go, we moved a lot as kids. So I always had my best friend with me wherever we went. It was awesome. I, so I never minded moving. So I don't know how it was for my other two sisters, but you know, we, we loved being in the same class. We didn't mind if we were in different classes growing up. We went to college together. Um, we played sports together. Do you have a twin communication? Like, can she feel what you're feeling? And yes. can she, yes, is, there's okay. wild stuff. Where they know I each want, other. Yeah. I want to know. They Give don't want us something. to play on the same team when we play games, like board games or thinking games, because we think so much it's alike. It's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fair. But it's yeah. it's super fun. I know when she had Drew, I ha like I wasn't going to be there. I was taking master's classes at the time. You know, I was like, yeah, she's pregnant, having a baby boy, you know. But the day she went to the hospital, like I drove, I don't even know, like 13 hours or 15 hours or something and had to be there. It was crazy. So, yeah, I got there. And it's interesting being married to a twin. Because, you know, they can, um, I remember early on, uh, there was a couple times when we would be hanging out when we were first married that I'd walk up behind Nikki and grab her. Oh, and, my gosh. And all of a sudden, I mean, <laughs> I, the first time, I was so mortified. But she was just like, she was cool. She was just like, oh, wrong one. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. I went to Tasha. I'm like, Tasha, we need to leave right now. I was like, we get me out of here. But 
Other uh, that being beside the point. Um, <laughs> That's hilarious. It, it, twins are uh-huh. a different dynamic. They're that they, they are on a different page than all of us. And it's funny they can. I mean, they can be. Fe- I mean, and it's not like it's all rainbows. They can get furious with each other, and they'll get furious with each other. And it's funny, but the moment I enter in, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, Nikki, and she's like, whoa, 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 that's my sister you're talking about. <laughs> it's, it's wild. Like I can't yeah. talk about. Nikki. I could be mad at her, but he can't. <laughs> you know, that's and fair. they can be that they can fair. be furious with each other. And then on the phone talking about, uh, we need to go. Uh, we need to go do this tomorrow. What time are you gonna pick me up? And I'm like, you were just super like crazy. You wouldn't get it. No, you I, would, I don't. I'm like more upset about game night situations. You're like, you never won. Yeah. You know, like the competitive of me, like, oh, whoa, you guys, game yeah. nights called off because every time you guys win, yeah. you can never play sequence again. No, it's it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. But I make sure that I'm on their team. So I usually win anyway. So. There it is. Yeah. Did you do any parent trap? situations oh. switch places oh my parents could tell us apart you know but in school we would like switch like if the teacher was at the board had her back to us we'd switch seats and then she wouldn't realize it then later she'd <laughs> be at the board again so we'd switch back so everybody else in the class would know but we never really wanted to take like change classes because then i'd have to go to history twice and who wants to go to history twice you know so i don't want to go once yeah, so, yeah. Get that. so yeah we didn't do too much of that and most of the time people could tell us apart up on the phone sometimes they couldn't too but you know but it's nice like we grew up in church so we'd you know if we were in church and something happened we'd look at each other or if we were like trying to I don't know tell each other something all I'd have to do is look and give kind of like a certain look with my eyes or whatever and Nikki would always know exactly what I was talking about it's awesome we can still do that yes yeah and I can start a sentence and she already knows what I'm gonna say (laughs) same same if she starts a sentence and Dave's like "What, what is she even talking about I'm like I'll tell you later yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I yeah. love it. Yeah. I love being a twin. I don't know about having twins. I'm, I'm sure it was hard on my mom, but being being a twin is great. Okay, our motto at Heritage, as you know, is making winners in life. So, what does that look like to you? And how are it. you currently winning in this season of life in Michigan? I love this question, and my answer is enduring. Winning is simply enduring. That's it. You just keep believing. You keep standing, you keep doing, you keep, no, you just, you know what God's word says and you keep doing what it says and you keep knowing that his promises are true and you, you just keep on keeping on and that's how you win. And cause the devil can't win. The devil cannot win unless you let him, but he doesn't have our permission. So we just keep on keeping on. What would you say, Dave? Hmm. I, I agree with Tasha. Everything she said, <laughs> everything she just said. Solid. Yes. Solid. And so in Michigan, so in our lives today in Michigan, we're trusting God. We know things are falling into place for us. And that's that's my favorite phrase with God is everything's always falling into place. And everything's falling into place for us. His business is taken off. Um, my, the, the last word I got from God was to rest. So I've been resting and um, you know, seeking him on what to do in the meantime. And I know he has big things. I have He's ministering to me about a few things, so uh, I'm going to seek him more about that. But I, I, I think, you know, in these last days, it's going to be exciting. It's, I mean, we should be excited as believers. Our lives are getting better and better. You know, John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. That means better and better. And so I just keep saying that. People ask me, how are you doing? Better and better, better and better. This was amazing. Like this, this is exactly why winning conversations exist. Like for me in my heart, like this conversation made my entire day. I love it. Like getting to know you guys better and like hearing your story, the struggles, like the true passion, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, like what was moving in your guys' lives. This is unbelievable. Like it's unbelievable. And this is going to be such fruit for so many people that hear this, that need to hear it. Um, thank you so much, both of you, Natasha. Thank you so much, Dave, for joining. This was an amazing conversation. So join us next week for uh, another episode of Winning Conversations.